Hey everyone, welcome to Kingdom Family Talks. This is Kaylee here with Leif. We are coming back with part two of our Navigating Storms series. If you listened to last week's podcast, uh, Leif shared about the war against rest. He shared uh, a little bit about what was going on in 2022 and what he believed that God was was speaking to him in this season. Um, I know in life, you you go through a lot of storms in life and the father gives you language for what you're going through. And it is so helpful for all of us who need help navigating storms. We know that there are physical, emotional, and spiritual storms. You talked about this in the last podcast. Um, what are some of the storms that are, could be physical? It could be COVID-19, uh, where one storm is wearing you out physically instead of you wearing it out. I loved when you said that on the podcast last week that there was a different thing happening to you. Um, the emotional storm could be perhaps you went through a, a great loss in life. Maybe you have less hours at work or you lost your pay or your job. Um, that can create emotional distress, or maybe there's a distress in relationships and then spiritual storms of what's going on in the culture, what's going on in the spiritual realm. Sometimes we're not aware of those things. And so um, thank you so much for giving language to those three items and, and those storms that we face. I know last week we talked about how Jesus was found sleeping on the boat in the middle of the storm he was facing. He was found resting. And you shared about why in the world would Jesus bring a pillow? <laughs> um, and I am just looking forward to this week. I'm going to go ahead and jump into the text. Um, and before I do that, there were three areas that you talked about in navigating a, a physical, emotional, or spiritual storm in your life. And that was how memory stones are going to help you. We see this in Mark 4.35. We see it in Matthew 4.22 through 36, which we're going to be talking about today. Um, the memory stones, the let us go verse in scripture to remember who God is and what he has done for your life, done in your life uh, is so helpful to navigate storms because as you're being hit on all sides, as culture is trying to inform you of who God is, it is so helpful for you to remember who he, ha he has been in your life. Uh, the second thing is watch what Jesus is doing in the storm. Is he resting? If he's resting, should you be resting with him? And the third item is what is Jesus bringing with him on the boat? He brought a pillow. We have to learn our weapons in, in our stormy seasons and rest is our weapon of warfare. Um, so this week, we're gonna be talking out of Matthew 14, 22 through 36. I'm gonna go ahead and jump into the text slave. And then we're gonna be talking about a different kind of storm that happens in life today. Matthew 14, 22 says, immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshiped him saying, truly, you are the son of God. When they had crossed over, they landed in uh, Gesseret. And when the men of that place recognized Jesus, they sent word to all the surrounding country. People brought others sick to him and begged him to let the sick just touch the edge of his cloak and all who touched it were healed. This is interesting because like today we're going to be talking about uh, storms that are God's will, kind of. That's something that we talked about last week. And specifically, this one's interesting because Peter was required to step out of the boat to come to Jesus. Um, I would love to hear your opening thoughts about this scripture and what it has to do with last week's teaching on storms. Now, I think that what we talked about is as an overall overview. Uh, I mentioned that earlier in January, he started to give me some language of 
what has taken place, what is taking place, and what will take place, since Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forever. So he is unchangeable. He, he, he is the same, but the way he shows up and the way he does it is not the same. Last time we talked eventually about there is a storm when Jesus is in a boat. And again, the whole purpose is to get to the other side. And it was an emotional, physical, and spiritual. Where we're going to learn how to have authority over the storms that we can sleep in. Uh, this storm is a war against rest because rest is your weapon of warfare. And it is out of rest you will wear the enemy out. It's similar like the Isaiah 40, 31, where he says, those that wait upon the Lord, meaning you've wrapped yourself up in him, they shall renew their strength. They shall mount our wings as eagle. They shall run and not grow weary. And they're going to walk and not faint. So the, the picture that is taking place with the first storm this is a storm where uh, the enemy would like us to panic, operate in fear. And of course, that's what the disciples did. But Jesus showed them a different way. So this is the kind of the clarity of that one is it is a war against rest. And we all are feeling that. And it has been where the enemy is trying to use fear, especially the disciple were afraid. This storm is a little bit different. And the reason I feel that this is important for people to see on a bigger picture is 2019, 2020, 2021, 2022. We are now, but we're heading into 2023 and 2024. I'm putting all of that together as a navigation tool that is going to be an ongoing thing. But these two storms are going like this. That means that in a moment, you will find the first storm, meaning Jesus is in the boat and he is resting and you have to learn to adjust like what you mentioned to his word, to what he is doing, to learning how to speak to the storm instead of about the storm and have to deal with both the physical, emotional, and the spiritual storm, but doing from a place of rest because he is resting because where the father is, there is rest, meaning get back into the identity. And of course, that's one of the reasons we are taking people through uh, these master classes blueprint for kingdom identity is to be able to have people that learn how to master life mm. the master way and that's what this is this is part of a training for reigning program for jesus then the second storm here is a little bit different because the bible says immediately jesus made his disciples go in the boat so this is different when he calls you to do certain things and then in the next moment he is not in the boat and it's a little bit different scenario jesus actually goes up to the mountain to pray while they are then going in the lake out of obedience and then moving into it so you maybe think life is going to be pretty good he called me to go on that mission trip or to take that job or i just talked to one person who just got a new job and and one who works doing research for us who's from Canada, but suddenly this whole week he has been in the middle of the storm because he didn't realize that, okay, there's one thing to get that job, but then now how to navigate the storm mm -hmm. that comes as a result of change. Change is very difficult, and you will see that. It's not just for the disciples, it's for every one of us. Yeah. And usually we change because we hurt enough where we had to. And you will find that here. And there's people all over the place that they're hurting enough. But that's not enough. An alcoholic is going to continue to drink until he gets liver cirrhosis, but he still continue to drink. It's crazy. And a drug addict, I mean, we see it now, especially what's going on. People are medicating themselves. So they're hurting enough. They have to change, but they don't know how to. But then they start to learn enough. And that's part of what we're doing here is to give the navigation tools. You learn enough. I, I want to change. I don't want to be crippled in fear. I don't want to drown in the middle of my storms. I don't want to be overwhelmed any longer by fear and etc. So now you're learning enough about that I, I, I do desire, I do want to change. But the third one that we have to have is the receiving enough, the receiving enough. That's where yeah. grace comes in and humility comes in because he gives grace to the humble. It's when we then start to receive enough where we're able to change. So this scenario where he says he made the disciples go in the boat, he sends the multitudes away, and then he goes up to the mountain and it was in the evening, and it was actually at the fourth watch, meaning it's the last moment of the hour. And now again, the storm is there. And it's again affecting. It's a physical, and we can name the physical mm -hmm. storms that's going on all over the world, including the gas pump. 
there's a real physical storm and fear for the future and all of the stuff that's going on. Even now when we're hearing that people are losing jobs and the recession and so you can name each individual should just take the pen and just name what are some of the physical storms. They could be health, they could be family, mm-hmm. it could be finances. And name those storms and be very clear about what the storms are instead of just ignoring them. Because storms are real. But it is not an enemy for us as Christians because the biggest thing he's teaching us to be overcomers in this life so mm-hmm. that we can help people to be able to navigate their storm. But as long as we are drowning in our storms, we cannot do anything for the world out there that are perishing and is panicking now in what's going on. So God, that's part of the reason we are doing this two series is just that now as we now are able to navigate ourselves through the storms, we can help other people to get language and to be of comfort, healing, and etc. And then the same is also the emotional storm that is happening and dealing with a true emotion. Like I shared some honest story, especially at the Love Awakening. And I do that through mm. the Blueprint series of having to deal with heart. What do you feel right now? Mm. Not head. Head would say all these things, but heart and do the heart test in the middle of the storm. What, what does the heart really feel? And for the disciples, again, it was crippled by fear heart was, where are you, Jesus? The heart is, we're drowning. The yes. heart is, you're not even in the boat right now. The heart is, and you can just go through it and define that. And then there is the spiritual storm. Jesus, where are you? Why would you tell us to go here? And you're leaving us here alone and etc. There's a lot of people that are feeling that. So that's part of my thing is how at the fourth watch and why the fourth watch, Jesus, why don't you show up when I prayed? If that was cancer or finances, why is it that you're waiting to the, in, in my translation, New King James Version says it was the fourth watch of the night and then when it was in the last minute, it's kind of a, uh, it's, it's 11.55 or 11.59 before it's noon, before something starts to happen. So why is this a key? And part of us, this kind of the last minute he shows up. And part of that is very clearly because a lot of us love him, but we don't trust him. So how do you navigate the total trust for him? Because if we trust in government, trust in subsidies, checks, we trust in, we trust in all these different things, but somehow do we really, really trust him to be our provider, to be our healer, to be our strength, to be our sustainer, to be our, is there a total, total trust in him? So there's nothing else. So I think that sometimes he is allowing us to not being able to trust anything else so that suddenly we realize that we have an option. Do I total trust him for everything in my life? Because mm. he's trustworthy. He is the Lord of my life. So the fourth watch is, is a trust test. And a lot of people right now are missing it. They're looking in panic to try to fill the gap or even to medicate the pain that they're feeling because the storms are coming. Because they do not realize, because here's the issue. They are not able to see him. Mm. And I know there's a lot of us in the middle of the storms that are unable to see him. But here is a key that I wanted to give. And then I'm going to let you continue the questioning. But here's the key here. So even when you're on your boat and you can't see him, I've been there several times in the last few weeks. And, and, and I've shared that as the same both with our uh, live audiences through the love awakening. But in the middle, when you cannot see him, you need to be where he is Uh, Of course, in our context, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he has not forgotten about you, and he is interceding in behalf of you, because he believed in you. So even when you cannot see him, he can see you. And what I didn't know when I was studying these scripture verses in January, right afterwards, I got a text from a friend who is a key partner in Texas that you know, and he, he was in Israel. And he was just visiting this mountain where Jesus went up to the mountain and prayed. And he said, interesting thing, when you're on the mountain, he said it when he heard me teach on this. He said, from the mountain, from the lake, they cannot see him. But from the mountain, he can see them. And we have to be aware, even when you cannot see him, he can see you. And you have to keep that in mind. He's keeping his eye on you. And so he's navigating those eyes that is navigating you in the middle of it. And yes, it is a fourth watch. And why did you wait so long, Jesus? And all those natural things that is going to teach us um, the supernatural trust that we need to have in somebody that is so trustworthy if you get to know him. 
And that's another thing that you start to see, how well do you know him? What kind of intimacy do you have with him? Do you know not just who he is, but do you know his ways? So when he yeah. is on the mountain to pray, he didn't leave you. He didn't forsake you because he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I am just there positioning myself for you now to learn yourself to navigate through these storms. And I am praying for you. But even then, when things get too overwhelming, and we're about to get there. So here's just some navigation tools that I was giving. Even when you cannot see him, he can see you. Even if it is the fourth watch of the night and you're looking at the watch, why are you waiting so long? It is not because he wants to torture you and this and that. It is mm -hmm. because of, and that's where some people that are not that they're struggling with the ways of God. But you have to understand this is an eternal training for reigning program. So what we're doing here temporary for this little time on earth is a preparation of training for reigning, both for eternity, but also what we're going to do in life. You're building muscles in the middle of it, that if there's no resistance, so he's teaching us and he's teaching us to total trust him. And I'm learning that more and more. And it's hard when it is on the fourth watch that he's showing up. And if he's like, mm -hmm. he's not showing up at all. That's a beautiful place. Do I totally trust him when nothing else makes sense? Like I talked to my best friend. He said, when I stood there and I hold first one of my child died. And then I had another one. And you will know who that is. But it's my best friend here in the city. So I said, tell me about your worst day. We were up having lunch last week. And he said, when I want to hold my boy there. And I said, God, and I was about to give up on God. And he was holding my child and he was dying. And he died. And then God came into this situation. And he said, okay, do you trust me in the middle of your loss? Do you trust me in the middle of your disappointment? Do you trust me in the middle of everything? And he went through a crisis moment where he wanted to give up. God, where are you? Why didn't you? And in the middle of all of that storm. But I see my friend, and you know that he is actually part of our master class as one of the instructor. And then he lost three children. And when he was holding the boy right there and realized like, when he lost that son, it was the darkest moment in his life. And he had to come into a place where nothing makes sense. Mm. And at that moment, that's the moment. So now when you see he's able to navigate through all kinds of storms in life, because even at the fourth watch moment, and even when things doesn't make sense, he found a God in the middle of the pain and in the middle of questions in the middle of when things doesn't make sense. He found something that has become the plumb line of his life. Because I was wondering, I said, there is a story behind why you are able to navigate so clearly through the dark clouds in life. So take me back to the lesson. And a couple of those I didn't even know about the detail and we sat there at the lunch table because I do knew, and that's part of what we're doing now is to give navigation tools. But he gave me some of those navigation tools that he learned, not during the best time, but during the worst time. It yeah. To be would be there. Even through the value of shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And he's going to prepare table even before my enemies. It's amazing. I just think about the the hidden war that takes place um, every day in all people is the the war of the mind, the thoughts. And I think that that is where the war on trust takes place. Really, it's a, the starting places in your thoughts. And you're talking a lot about trust. I would love to hear from you. What does that actually, what has that practically looked like in your life to rebuild trust? Perhaps you are in the middle of a storm and you realize you are in chaos. You're like, I don't trust God. I really think this might be the end of me. This is a dark night of my soul. I don't know if I believe that Jesus is interceding for me on my behalf. Um, what, in what ways in your own life, have you rebuilt trust with God and waged war on those thoughts? I know last week you talked about memory stones that really does help you when you think rightly about God, when you, you know, he is a loving father, it helps you uh, to navigate these storms a lot better, but from your perspective and experiences, practically, how have you built trust with God and how has that changed in the way you navigate storms? I think, I mean, we talked about it yesterday, I mean, uh, uh, because this is a different audience maybe than the love awakening, but I, I just shared honestly, just I had a, I had a test a little over a week ago and I was just wondering why do I feel this sadness and loneliness? I'm in the middle of another one of those. It was a storm and it was connected to trust. I didn't know, I didn't know it at the time, 
that was connected because what's happened with me is I had a Todd Bevan who traveled with me for 10 years. Everywhere we went, he was there with me. He was an armor bearer. I didn't need to try to tell him what my heart was. He knew my heart. He knew my heartbeat. He was covenant. He was a son. God called him that everything we were going to do, we were going to do together. So even when it came to the future and the prophetic words, it was not about me. It was about we. So Todd Bevan was that person in my life and Wendy and the children and everything else. And then he was with me in Cuba, came home, had hemorrhage. And I trusted God. Uh, it's just hemorrhage. And for the next year, he went to the doctor, didn't feel well, travel less and less with me because he just had some discomfort. And then by 2015, I still was, I was in Indonesia and I did get the call. He said, Papa Leif, he said, I, I got stage four cancer. And I don't know why the doctors just sent me home for a whole year because the specialist said, you should have come a year earlier and we could have saved your life. But oh, we're going to do the best that we can. And they started horrific, everything from the chemo to radiation, everything we can imagine. And I watched slowly. And every time I was exhausted, I came home. I trusted God. He's going to live and not die. Took him to Bethel Reading, took him all over, put my money, my time, my energy, flew to Seattle in my exhaustion, sat at his bed. You're going to live and not die. He started to feel better. His color came back and we, we're making it. And then on February, when uh, I was standing there in Norway visiting my parents, there was a special birthday, took away everything. I got the call from Wendy, his wife, and says he died. Mm. But every word that was spoken, we're gonna, he's going to live and not die. I had all the prophets. I have everything. This doesn't make sense to me. Uh, I had another very close friend like Bob Phillips, similar situation where Bob himself was a covenant friend and with Papa Jack, we did life together for 10 years. He traveled with me. He was my support. He was holding up my rod. I was helping him. And in that journey, again, suddenly he died of a heart attack. And then my spiritual Papa that came home from Pakistan. I'm exhausted. I'm flying down, sitting there at the hospital bed. He's going to live and not die. And you're fighting for him. Uh, I need my spiritual Papa. And then we know the story last year, April 25th. So the three closest people that is connected to my destiny to get to me to the other side of the lake mm -hmm. is all dead and I'm alone. And the gap that feel called loss. Then I went to all of the betrayal of friends that you brought closely into you, the Judas that sold you, the one that betrayed you, the one that stabbed you. And I went to the list of those things, the friend that, started to do some real estate, knew it was God, this was going to be my blessing, took $50,000 that he was going to pay while I'm on a mission to pay the contractor. And instead he stole all of that money, was a friend. Uh, the person that drove me into the mountain wall and I've had pain every day since. And so I just went through all of those things, the betrayal, <laughs> losses, the disappointments, and all of those different things that doesn't make sense. So in the middle of, is my circumstance, like Job said very clearly, even though you slay me, I will trust you. If you strip everything away from me, if you kill my, if, if you allow the enemy to do whatever it is, if you say it's the enemy, but God is sovereign, he is. So I, I don't question the sovereignty of God. So my new natural tendency for anyone to say God is good and I'm loved, that's the essence of my love. But how does this look like when Todd was supposed to live? So even, God, you're bigger than the devil. So even if it was the devil that killed him with cancer and whatever the theology yeah. is, it doesn't make any sense. And so in the middle of the losses and disappointments, I made a list. That was just last week you took me through that. Of the losses, the disappointments, and all of that. So in the middle of it, how did I navigate that to trust him? Yeah. So then I had to come into a point that I gave up my right at the moment when I followed him. Uh, and in the next right. moment, I, I don't have any answer. Mm. And I am a bleeding. And then I'm looking at the list of Paul from the shipwreck to you just go to his list. So I then realizing that, okay, God, uh, in the middle of it, am I going to trust you? When, wow, there was a breakthrough or the healing. Or do I trust you as much in the losses as I do in the gain? In the breakdown as the breakthrough? Yes. 
in the disappointment as the divine appointments. So people are seeing what I have with awards all over this office of what I was trusted on that, that side. But you didn't want to be falsely accused like the Potiphar's wife. You didn't want the prison. You didn't want the pit. You didn't want to betray. So it was 11 of those things that Joseph went to before he was there in the palace to learn to total trust him. Okay. So I'm thinking that some people in the sense that it's almost like God owes you something. And mm. then the next moment, even there, I see some people online that says, God must be a child abuser. How could I, with my own natural children, throw them over to the pit bulls and in the next moment to teach them a lesson? Uh, that's kind of their view, uh, mm. which is just a whole warped way of trying to communicate. If God is good and God is love, why would he allow these things to happen? Because of who he is. So, so yeah. some of us that... It, it, a lot of that gets back into, do you know him? That's and do you know him well? And no, I'm not thinking any of this evil or any of those things that I'm going through comes from him. But he is allowing certain things to take place because we're living in a fallen world and there's certain things that takes place for me to be able to, that if I trust him, it becomes upgrades. I can help people that mm. are out there, including today, to navigate the storm, not because I've read some scripture verses and got some revelation, but because I've been in the middle of the storm. And Jesus could relate to every single person that is out there, whatever you're going through. Look at his hands and his scar. Betrayal? Look at his hands and his scar. He knows about betrayal, Peter. Yes. Oh, loss. So when I felt like I was going through loss, you don't understand. Todd was supposed to be with me. He said, well, John the Baptist, when they cut his head. He was my cousin. He was supposed to be there. And anything you're going through, Jesus went through this, not just kind of a, hey, I take care of everything, so now life is just going to be good. No, so that you can follow in my footstep and just become just like me. That's right. So what we've had a message that I'm going to take you to Sunday so you don't have to have a Friday. No, when he died, I died. Mm. When he was buried, I was buried with him. But also when he rose, I rose with him. So that's connected to the message that we are following. And, and at this very moment, he gave us a comforter, a counselor, the Holy Spirit, so we can be connected both to the Father and the Son in the middle of no matter what is going on. So I think that the trust element is connected to understanding the very nature of God, that yes. no matter what happened here in life, this is just a temporary and we're living in a fallen world. And a lot of the people right now that are going in and, and giving up or throwing or medicating or all the things they're doing in the middle of this storm is because they do not really. First of all, I think that a lot of people have bought into a message, a gospel message, because it's supposed to be good news. And then when bad news happen, they're giving up or, or they're saying Jesus didn't work. You were not in the boat when I needed you. And so there's people right now that I think that when you're realizing this God that loves you so much, that he will send his only begotten son. And the most beautiful thing for me, if I'm in the Middle East, in the middle of the darkness, that it doesn't matter what I face, he is there. That even if they crucify me, I'm not worthy to be crucified like Jesus. Crucify me upside down. I gave up my life and I gave up for one single purpose. I'm living here temporary for something mm. that is eternal. But when yeah. we lose the eternal realm and we think that he owes us a good, pleasant, everything is supposed to be just very, very easy. I think we're also losing out on the other side of this because you really will never celebrate a Sunday meaning for here in the storm to get to the other side if you do not have the Friday, the storm, and the Saturday between. Uh, so I've often said that that gospel message, the good use of the message is that I've been crucified with Christ. I have been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I who live. But it is Christ now who lives in me, Galatians 2.20. And the life I now live, I live for him. I can trust him in the same way. Could Jesus trust him after everything he went through? How could a father, even if there is another way, father, and with a cross on etc.? Is this father really good? Jesus came to show us how good he is and how loved people are. You cannot, there's not be one day that you would, even in the middle of all the worst moments, Last week when I tested again, I went through those things and he rubbed me through my scar. There's not one moment I question how good God is and how loved I am. I can say that for 22 years. There's things that, that doesn't make sense. There's things that I'm living with mysteries more than I live with miracles. 
But in the middle of all of that, I get to take personal inventory and say, mm -hmm. do I value you <laughs> for what you're going to do for me? Or do I value you that in the middle of whatever is going on, even when it doesn't make sense, I trust you. And I used to say, show me, show me, show me, and then I will trust you. And he says, mm. trust me, trust me, trust me, and I will show you. That's right. Um, if you are listening and you're thinking, I don't know if I could ever navigate a storm from this type of perspective or position, we want to encourage you that you can. This is a part of the sonship journey, your identity in Christ. Um, the reality is uh, you must increase, I must decrease. Uh, the Apostle Paul in Philippians is saying from prison, I have no need. Uh, he had a proper view of God. He had an absolute trust and confidence in who Jesus is. Um, and he had experienced the faithfulness of both. He was persecuted. Um, he is just a hero of mine, but he really does exemplify this of going through a lot of crazy storms and having absolute trust in God. And I love that you brought that up because there is an element where you have to remove yourself from the picture. You have to realize you gave yourself to Christ. Um, it is not you who lives. It is Christ who lives in you. Um, and your walk has to look a little different. And so when you know that, when you know who you are, um, you are able to know who God is correctly. You can navigate these storms from confidence, knowing that Jesus is interceding for you. He's praying for you and you can overcome because Jesus already overcome. Um, and if you're listening and you want to learn more about your identity, if you want to know how can I get to this position in this place, uh, we want to invite you to come apart and be a part of our identity masterclass. It's called the Blueprint for Kingdom Life. It launches this fall on September 5th. It is a 12-week intensive journey where we learn and talk about identity in Christ. We talk about what it looks like, um, and we help you step into those divine exchanges in your life where you can recognize the areas that don't look like Jesus and exchange them for the likeness of Christ. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about your identity, we do want to invite you to be a part of that. You can visit uh, blue, uh, kingdomlifeblueprint.com to learn about more uh, of this journey. You can check the description as well. We'll have a link for you. Leif, do you have any final words before we end this podcast? I thought at least giving a couple of a few more key things as an overview for about the next maybe six, seven minutes, I will take time just for the people to see because it was in the fourth watch of the night. And again, mm. the Bible says this is, I'm in verse 25. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled saying, it is a ghost. And they cried out of fear. So I just saying that here's one thing is, we are so used to the way that he's supposed to come. And maybe it is that sweet Jesus in a manger. Mm -hmm. But here, suddenly he's showing up in a little bit different way than they are familiar with. And I don't know if it him walking on the water or what it looked like on a distance, why they were so scared that somebody's walking on the water in the middle of us. Jesus then spoke to them and said, hey, guy, be of good cheer. It is I. Mm -hmm. Do not do not be afraid. That's crazy to say not be afraid in the middle of it. It's like me telling my dogs last night when there's fireworks, do not be afraid. And then thunderstorms during the night, I didn't sleep much. And all my three dogs is panicking in the middle. And I'm saying, do not be afraid. It's just firework. And it, I mean, it's that kind of a thing for the believers. And Peter answers, Lord, I want people to capture a couple of these. If it is you, if it is you. Mm. If it is you. So we're not even sure who he is in the middle of it. But Lord, if this is you, command me to, to walk on water. And Jesus says, it is my, it is I. Just come. So a couple of things here. The, low, the, 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 the bigger the storm and the closer you are to the end of yourself, the louder the what if. Is this him mm. or is the devil or what is it? The loud what if. What if, is this you? Is this you? Is that becomes very loud at the fourth watch and people have to be aware. But here is a kingdom lesson. Instead of having what if fear, why don't you tap into what if faith? 
what if fail. Those are the two choices in the middle of all the noise. At that moment, what I'm doing is I'm making a list of all of the storms emotionally, physically, spiritually, but I'm making also a list that say, I'm going to tap into what if fail. What if everything the enemy is trying to do, including the last trip that we just did in the Middle East, there was 11 of those different things that happened. And a couple of them, two incidences, I almost got killed. One, I got attacked privately late at night i smuggled myself out into this horrific area and a group of people attacked me i couldn't get out of there so i mean i could just make a list out of that and automatically fear comes in and the bible says stay mm. and he says do not be afraid it is i and then he says come sometimes here's another area often the way he speaks is in a very simple way go come rest be still mm. We are trying to get the prophetic word and we get intercessors to pray and isn't it when he's already spoken. So just be aware of the simplicity of sometimes what he says. He says, come. That, so we are looking for a confirmation. No, the word come is the confirmation. Wow. And we have to do that. But what we do then in the next one, because we still have doubt. So we are saying if we can get three prophets to confirm that, or if I can get my intercessors and my friends, and what we're doing is just trying to talk ourselves out of faith. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. You're no longer pleasing to God until you see the invisible and can do the impossible and step out of your comfort zone and step into faith. So without faith, so he's teaching us faith, which is the whole key and the currency of how to move heaven. And then Peter answered, and then eventually Jesus says, come. And then the Bible says in verse uh, 29, and when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on water mm. to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. And he cried, I was like, Lord, save me. Here's another key principle. Mm. Jesus said, why do you have little faith? There's a couple of things that I want us to say about this. One of them is when your faith is little, his grace is still big. You mm -hmm. only need a mustard seed faith. So what if I pray for that person and they don't get healed? Or what if I take a risk if it doesn't work? What if it does work? What if they do get healed? What if there is lessons that you do learn? So I mean, the what ifs. But now, so my thing is here, what if? Tap into faith. Well, what, what if I sink? I want you to know when you start to operate in faith, keep your eyes on Jesus. But what was happening here, the wind was contrary, is my translation, New King James, meaning there's a wind against you. And that's another key principle here. So if you think about the wind that's coming here, Jesus is over on this side. So the wind is there. So when you speak, if this is you, the wind carries that to Jesus. So the contrary wind is actually carrying your words so Jesus can hear it. Wow. And so that's another area is the contrary wind. But what he's teaching us in the book of John, chapter six, the same passage, John gives another analogy of it. He said they rode against, against the wind for three to four miles. That's part of what we're learning in this storm. Mm -hmm. The other storm we're wrestling with, this one you need to learn how to go against the storm and pressing in and getting to the other side and to get perseverance and to be able to start not to rowing against the wind. You cannot do that if you're totally fatigued after the first storm, because now out of fatigue, you are there and you're drowning in the middle. Of it. Another key principle, I'm just giving you a couple of quick one here that I feel is just gold nuggets from this. When you're walking in the water, even when your faith is little, his grace is big. The key thing here is Peter walked quite a bit on water. Jesus is coming towards him. But if you know that he looked like a ghost in a distance, he must have walked far enough and Jesus walked far enough that when he was sinking because he got overwhelmed by his circumstances again. And that happened with me a few times during this last trip. But then quickly I look at Jesus and he reaches out his hand. So when my faith is little and I'm sinking, his grace is big and his mm. hand is stronger than my lack of faith. And he pulls me back up again. And I had one more lesson together with him. And that's the beauty of his grace. So I want people to yeah. tap into his grace in this season because it, that's the key. That it is not that the faith and the grace has to operate together. And then the Bible says that the wind ceased and then everybody in the boat came and they started to worship him. That's the whole purpose. But everybody in the classroom starts to worship him. The people in the community start worshiping him. And suddenly the environment starts to change. 
And that's what this is all about. It is not walking on water. It is not. It is learning to become worshipers in spirit and in truth in the middle of our circumstances so we can change the environment. And the byproduct of that, when they then got to the other side, was transformation. And as many as touch him, they were made perfectly well, major healing. Now we can bring a transformation to the world on the other side. That if it was not for this journey and this storm, we couldn't be able to deal with some of the things that was on the other side because that world is also in a storm and now because of the encounters that we've had with him in the middle of it we become an encounter that can eventually bring yes. jesus into and bringing hope to a world that is on the other side that is waiting for us that is another key element to this is this is what gives pain purpose knowing that no i am not going to go back i'm not going to drown in the middle of it the first yes. one i need to learn how to rest but this one i'm going to roll against the wind I'm going to learn how to walk on water. I'm going to learn how to speak to the storm. I'm going to also learning to row against the wind. And sometimes for me, that's been months. Sometimes it's been years learning mm. to row against the wind. There's words that I had that it took 20 years of rowing against the wind before I got to the other side and saw breakthrough, including one big ethnic group with over 40 million people. 20 years of rowing against a wind that every yeah. time I tried, the wind was coming against me. So somebody after 30 minutes oh i rode against the wind and didn't work and he's teaching us so many different elements because he's building us muscles so that we can be ready for the revival and the breakthrough and the reformation that the world desperately need we don't have any other choice we need to bring jesus to the other side here and to be able to touch a wall that desperately yeah. need to have an encounter with Jesus, the healer, the strength, the joy, the peace, and especially the fruit of the spirit that I think can be a greater weapon of warfare than the gift of the spirit in this season. Yeah. Wow. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for sharing. If you're listening, be encouraged. Uh, this can happen in your life as well. You can have this position in adverse situations. You can have the ability to discern what kind of storm you're in, who Jesus is in that storm and choose to follow him, whether he's asking you to go into the storm, into a wilderness season, or he is asking you to rest where you are and to trust in him. We bless you all. Thank you for joining us today. Leif, could you pray for us? I'd like to do that. Father, I just wanted to thank you so much that you are a good, good father. That's who you are. That's who you are. And loved and loved and loved. That's who we are. So I just ask right now that you, Holy Spirit, Holy, Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit whom the Father has given in my name, I think it's John 14, 26, he will teach you all things. But he also will remind you of everything that I have told you. Mm -hmm. So even now when people, there's people right now that are on the way into a storm. There's people that are on the way, they're right in the middle of a storm. And there's people that are coming out of a storm. But no matter which part of that journey we are in, uh, I just thank you for both these two storms. And for what it is doing as part of the training for raining program. I don't like the storms. But I like what is happening in me. In the middle of the storm, my roots go deeper and deeper and deeper into trust, yes. into identity, into intimacy. The very thing that is needed so that I can, when I get on the other side, knowing who I am and whose I am and to be able to deal with the circumstances that is around me. I thank you, Father, that the storms makes us or breaks us. It makes us either wine or shine. The storms in the middle of all of these things, we throw overboard a lot of the things that we don't need for the other side. So I'm just even asking for a lot of people right now, mm. as you are dealing with physical storms, emotional storms, or spiritual storms, whatever storms they are in right now, I just thank you, Jesus, that you are the Prince of Shalom. You're the royal son of Shalom, Prince of Peace. Mm of wholeness in the middle of everything that's going on. And I thank you, Jesus, that you are a healer, you are a wisdom, you are a strength, you are a hope. And I thank you, Jesus, that you are trustworthy and we can trust you. 
with everything, even when it doesn't make sense. You are Lord. And we don't have any plan B, only plan A. Yeah. So we trust you with our past. We trust you with our present. And we trust you with our future. Because you are the same both yesterday. And you are the same today. And you're going to be the same forever. We love you, Jesus. We welcome you, Jesus. We welcome you to lead us into the storm, to be in the middle of the storm, or even be up on the mountain to pray for mm. us. We welcome you, Jesus, when you invite us to walk on water and you look like a ghost. So even when we cannot see you, let us recognize your voice so that when we say, if this is you, the contrary wind that is trying to stop us to get to the other side, instead of trying to rebuke it, let us build the muscles that is needed so that we can be able to have resilience for the next season. God bless us in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Leif. That was rich. I look forward to the next time. Thank you. Thank you.